I've been a Chick-fil-A operator for 22 years now. And, and 10 years into this, I was awarded my third Chick-fil-A franchise. And six years after that, I realized that I was not in a good place spiritually. It was because I was just working too much. I mean, I go to church on Sunday, it would be stressed out about Monday, even though we were close. And I never thought I would be in this place, but I, but I was, and I was not uh, the man God was calling me to be. I decided to make my life less complicated by taking a third of the responsibilities away. So I called Chick-fil-A and said, thank you for the opportunity, but I need to give up a restaurant because it's the right thing to do for my walk with the Lord and my family. It was at that time I decided to start this mentor discipling program. So I said, why not just start where my ministry is, which is right there in my restaurants. I created an invitation and gave it to some guys in the, in the business and said, let's talk about biblical manhood and what that looks like. So I finished up a couple of uh, rounds of discipling with some, some guys, and then I had to put a pause on it because I ran out of people to give the invitations to. But I, I'm looking around the church and I'm like, I see a lot of men that I'd like to see interacting together as we figure out as a church body, you know, what can we do to have an impact in our homes, community, and, and so forth. So I felt God was calling me to approach the church to lead the men's ministry. And I said, I don't know if I'm equipped to do it, if they would even let me do it, but I asked because I wanted to do something more than what I was already doing. And now we've been through a couple of Bible studies now and it's been fantastic. There's been lots of healing and lots of celebrations and um, new relationships have been formed. Everyone has a story. And if we can all share those stories with each other, we won't feel so alone in this battle, you know, because Satan's out to get us, right? But if we can just all come together and say, not today, Satan, I think we'll be stronger, stronger and better together. I came across Hebrews 12, 11, just this past week. It says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I'm exactly where I need to be right now. And I thank God that he had patience for me. How many of you saw those waffle fries and were like, man, Chick-fil-A sounds good. <laughs> that happened to me. Sorry to disappoint you. No, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Jeff... Uh, Jeff White is, is a big reason why my wife and I are together, so um, I, I love hearing from him and love hearing his heart uh, because he's somebody that, that follows Christ and follows him well. Um, one of the things that we love in our culture uh, is winning. We like winning, right? And, and not just winning, but progress towards a goal of winning. So it's why uh, this week, the two probably most talked about football games of the season one happened Monday night, one happened last night, uh, and the reason why everybody's talking about them is because the number of points that were scored. Uh, last night was 74, what, 72? a and LSU, I don't watch that much football, but uh, yeah, there we go. Um, and so, um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of offense people want to see scoring. Nobody really talks about the exciting 10-7 to game or the 6-3 to game because we like to see people producing. We want to see touchdowns scored. We want to see runs scored, offense going up. It's the same in our businesses, right? How do you know a successful business? Are they making money? If they are, then they're a successful business. If they're not making money, then they're not a successful business. And what we do is because we love winning and because we love seeing progress towards a goal and it's a cultural thing in our, in our society, we have now applied it to Christianity and our churches. So how do you know a successful church? Are there more people going to it than other places? It's a successful church. Are there fewer people? Probably not that successful. God's probably not doing anything there. I'm sarcastic, by the way. <laughs> and we apply it to our personal life as well. Am I doing more good things than I'm doing bad things? Then I'm probably a good Christian. I'm probably following Jesus well. I think if I were to ask many of you, 
How do you know if you're a successful Christian? Many of us would respond with either, I don't, I don't really know. Or you might respond with, well, I'm going to church every week. I might be in a connect group. Maybe I'm not. I might come on Easter Sunday. That, that, that target probably moves. Well, I'm trying, I, I usually come on Easter and Christmas, and now I'm going to start coming like once a month. So I'm making progress towards being a good Christian. The bottom line is I don't know that we really know. And I think what we have done is we've applied business, sports, winning metaphors to our Christian life and said that's success, progress towards a goal. And what's the goal, right? So what I want us to talk about today as we finish up our Rediscover Park Cities is something that I hope when you walk out of here will be incredibly freeing for you. Some of you will wind up being frustrated. And I think the reason why you're going to be frustrated is because you're going to be like, but what am I supposed to do? And that's kind of the point. It's kind of the point. So we're going to be in John chapter 15. And we're going to stay there pretty much the whole time. And we're going to ask, what does a successful disciple look like? A successful follower of Christ. We're wrapping up this Rediscover Park Cities. We're, We're looking at what it looks like to follow Jesus every day. And so I'm excited about this morning. So the first thing successful disciples do is that they stay connected. Successful disciples stay connected. So where we find ourselves in John chapter 15 is Jesus is kind of talking to his disciples for the last time uh, before his crucifixion. And he's going through a whole host of things. So he starts in chapter 13. He washes their feet. He tells them a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. John chapter 14, 15, he prays for them. He gets into, or sorry, John chapter 16, 17, he prays for them. He gets into uh, who the Holy Spirit is and what his role will be after Jesus is crucified. And one of the major themes in this whole conversation is the fact that the Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. So the Father's in the Son and the Son is in the Father. There's this connectedness. And then in John chapter 14, he includes somehow the disciples into this. And the way he decides to illustrate this, starting in John chapter 15, is the illustration of the vine and the branches. So let's walk through this uh, illustration of Jesus's and see what a successful disciple looks like. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. Okay, let's stop there. So Jesus is talking, so he's the one that says I. Now, why does he say true? Why does he say the true vine? That implies that at some point, there was a vine that was not true, correct? In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, Israel is referred to often as a vine, And the problem with that vine was it wasn't very productive. In fact, in almost every instance it's used, the vine is met with judgment because it's not producing fruit. So Jesus is coming in, and one of the major themes of the book of John is Jesus is the true vine. Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the one that's going to do the job that Israel was supposed to do. He's filling, he's he's doing what what they were supposed to do. And so it's in this that Jesus is saying, I'm the true vine. Now, what does a vine do? We're we're talking about a plant that produces grapes. And I know we're Baptists, but it's obviously with the interest of producing wine. It's okay. We'll get through it. It's a vine producing grapes. And so a vine is kind of the, if you're comparing it to a tree, uh, it's kind of the trunk. It's the most important part of the plant. It's the one that's connected to the roots. It's the part that's connected to nutrients and to water and to the ground. And out of the vine sprout branches and leaves and fruit. If you have a good vine, you will have good fruit. If you have a bad vine, you will have bad fruit. And Jesus is obviously a good vine. But he doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He says, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the father is the vine dresser. What does this mean? It means that the father is providing growth, uh, oversight, oversight and, and, and leadership over the whole entire plant. So his role is kind of twofold. The father sees plants or sees branches that aren't producing and he removes them. And we read on later that they're gathered together and they're cast aside. So this tells us that these are people, branches, who are not really followers of Christ. They're not people that are really connected to the vine. These are people who talk a good game. They may act religious. They may act spiritually. They may even attend church regularly. 
but they're not producing fruit. You're not seeing anything in their life. There's no change. We would call them in our church the cultural Christian. Somebody that comes to church because it looks good or because it's what you're supposed to do, but Monday through Saturday, there's not really any fruit being borne out. Their life's not any different because of it. But he also comes in and he prunes the good branches. And this is good for us to hear because followers of Jesus also have parts of our branch. We are the branches. He reads that next in in verse five, uh, that don't really produce fruit. Some parts of our branch do, it works, but then other parts are kind of maybe dried up, maybe not producing well enough. And the father comes in and he prunes those back like any good gardener would do. So there are parts of our lives that look like cultural Christians. What might some of these things be? How about idolatry? There are things that we love more than God, and it inhibits our ability to produce fruit. It inhibits our connectedness to the vine, because rather than turning to Christ, we turn to these things for comfort, for satisfaction, for encouragement, for medication, uh, self-medication, whatever it might be. Also, some of the things that God might want to prune back, God does prune back, our preferences, our comforts, some of our stabilities. So last week, uh, we had a power outage in here, right? And the Great Hall didn't have worship last week. And so some of us made the trek, the quarter of a mile that it is across campus. Uh, It's literally a quarter of a mile from end to end. It's not a joke. Um, From end to end, and we went to the sanctuary. But some of us saw that our worship service wasn't meeting, and we took the elevator back down to the garage, and we went home. That's an area of preference, and that's an area that, if I may be so bold, needs pruning. Because we are worshiping what we prefer over the God who sent his son to die for us. But it's not just preferences, sin, things like that that God prunes back. He also prunes back things that uh, inhibit us, that we would want to have pruned back. Fears, anxieties, worries, sicknesses, illnesses. That's why God heals God doesn't heal just because he loves us. He does heal because he loves us. But he heals so that we might bring him more glory and bear fruit. That's also one of the reasons why he doesn't heal. He may remove good things in our lives, like jobs that we really love. He may remove dreams that we have that might never be realized. Our God prunes us. And he prunes us, and Hebrews 12 tells us that this discipline, because that's kind of what it is, this discipline is evidence that we are children of his and that he loves us because a good parent, a good father, will discipline his children. A good father, a good vine dresser, will prune his plant. And so, obviously, we are the branches. We are the branches. Now, how did we become branches? He tells us in verse 3, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So the moment that you hear the words of Jesus, the moment that you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, is the Son of God, died on the cross for your sins and mine, was resurrected, and you put your trust and faith in him for salvation, boom, congratulations, you've sprouted as a branch. You're no longer a dead branch, you're a living branch that is grafted into the vine and you are connected to him. And it is on believing his words. And this is where we struggle. Because it's like, wait, I don't have to earn anything. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to buy this. And it's like, no, you just really just have to take Jesus at his word. It's really hard for us to do because we live in a skeptical society. Can I really trust you with this? And so what is the measure then of a successful disciple? One that has sprouted forth. It is one that remains, that abides. Look at verse four. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That abide means to remain or stay. I am the vine. He says it again. And you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The church, the disciples of Christ, the followers of Jesus, we sprout forth from the vine. We are the branches and we have nutrients. We only have the ability to do anything that we do through the power of Christ, working through his Holy Spirit. Apart from that, we can do nothing. But we still think, one of the the things we just sang, uh, we we sang that he is our righteousness, our one defense. But what we actually live like is that we have good work, good work, good work, good work. When all that falls apart, Jesus is like our last line of defense. That's not what scripture teaches. Jesus is the only line of defense between us and utter failure. 
Because Jesus has already done everything. The win has already been won. And that's really hard for us because we look at star athletes and star businessmen and celebrities and we want to be LeBron, right? I want to be a spiritual LeBron. I don't know what that looks like. But recognizing that, you know, just like many teams that LeBron has played on, there's really only one LeBron. There's only one Christ and he's done everything. And so we need to remain in him. And this is what I think the greatest mark of a true disciple is. If you want to know, in my opinion, what is a true successful disciple is, it is this, that they remain in Christ. They remain a follower of Jesus. They stay in his love for a lifetime. They persevere in their faith. But instead, what we do is we offer a Christless Christianity. We think the win is a bunch of do's and a bunch of don'ts. And if the do's outweigh the don'ts, I'm in good shape. We think it's looking like a Christian. We think it's getting your ticket punched to go to heaven, and then you just kind of chill out until Jesus comes back or you die. That's what we think the win is. We think the win isn't the gospel infiltrating more and more of our lives and understanding that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has just as much to do with my marriage as it does with my eternal destination. That Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has just as much to do with my divorce as it does with me hoping for eternal salvation. That my school and the, the degree that I'm pursuing or the, the career that I want to have in my life, the gospel has more to do with that than I could ever imagine. We think the win is getting better and better. It's not what the win is. The win is staying connected to Christ. The win is staying in the vine. True followers of Jesus may go through seasons of doubt, struggles with sin, but the true follower of Jesus Christ will always come back to the vine. You will persevere in your faith. You'll keep going. It may have peaks, it may have peaks, it may have valleys. It may be one of steady growth. You might not go through peaks and valleys. But is overall your growth in Christ one that is progressively you becoming closer to Christ or is it one that's not? Do you find yourself more like Christ today than you were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or not? And if the answer is no, you need to ask yourself, am I connected to the vine? The answer may actually be yes. You may be going through a difficult season, but that's something you need to evaluate. You need to look at. Is my hope for eternal salvation in Jesus Christ alone, or is it Jesus plus what I'm trying to do? When you fall into sin and temptation, and all of us do, do you approach it with, man, I just got to work harder. Man, I'm such, a, I'm such a failure. God must hate me. Or is it you coming before the Lord and being like, Jesus Christ, I am sorry. I confess what I did, and I agree with you that it's wrong, and I give you praise that it is not up to me to save myself. Thank you for your cross. There's a massive difference between the life of this believer and this believer. Salvation rests on Christ alone, and so does your perseverance. So stay connected to the vine. Stay connected to the vine. Now, you might ask, well, what does that like, look like? Like, How do I know if I'm connected to the vine? Well, I want us to look at that right now. Successful disciples will show it. We're going to keep reading in John chapter 15. Now, before I get into this, because we have uh, sort of a, an ethos in our culture of checking boxes and making sure how many people love lists, you're like the person that like writes a list and on it you put things that you already did so that you can cross it off. You're sick. You're sick. No, I'm just kidding. You're fine. We like lists and we like being able to check things off. So we're about to walk through several fruits that Jesus talks about in John chapter 15. And the temptation is for you to be like, oh, do that one. Nope, don't do that one. And then you're going to give yourself a score at the end. That is not the purpose of this. Jesus bears the fruit through us. He's the vine. We are the branches. Everybody say it with me. I'm a branch. I said with me. I'm a branch. You guys did great. I was just teasing you. I'm a branch. You're not a vine. Jesus produces fruit through you and in you. It's not work harder. It's believe Christ more. So let's walk through this together. So the first fruit that Jesus talks about that we show is an effective prayer life. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now, on first reading, you might look at verse seven and think to yourself, so that means I can just pray for whatever I want and I'll get it. And that means that I'm a fruitful disciple. No, because of the qualifier of verse eight, by this, my father is glorified. God is glorified by our prayers. So we pray towards God's glory. The way that we pray, the end to which we pray is praying towards God's glory. So Let's take the branch analogy. If you're a branch in a tree or a vine, what do you think a branch would ask of the tree or the vine? The branch would probably ask for more nutrients, right? Man, could really use some more of that miracle grow. That's good stuff. Water. I like that. It's good. Uh, I'm kind of in the shade during like the morning. Could you like move me a little bit to where I'm in the sun a bit more? And why would a branch ask for such things? To bear fruit to bear fruit. They want to bear fruit. The branch wants to be a productive branch. The branch doesn't want to die. It wants to be productive. And in the same way, we should pray. But often we don't pray like branches. We pray like branches that want to go off and start their own vine. Like, I'm going to go start a satellite location somewhere else. Jesus, we're branches. We don't become vines, right? That's not how this works. So what are some ways that we can pray like a branch instead of a vine? Well, that's what's great about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer actually helps us do this. We pray with a mind towards extolling the branch, or sorry, the vine for who he is and what he's done. Extolling the vine dresser for who he is and what he has done, right? Hallowed be thy name. So we praise the vine for being glorious and beautiful and allowing us to be a part of such a wonderful plant. We pray with a mind toward confession and repentance. Why? Because we hope for pruning. I confess and repent hopefully hoping that the Lord will come in and take away those things with which I struggle. That there will be pruning that takes place. We pray with requests and not just for ourselves, although it's appropriate to pray and ask things of the vine for yourself. But we also pray on behalf of the entire tree, the entire vine itself, the other branches. We see another branch struggling. We're like, Lord, God, break in and help that struggling, struggling branch. And then we pray with gratitude. Thank the Lord for what he's done for us. This is how we pray effectively and fruitfully. It's not just me-centric, although it's a part of it. It's centered on Christ and him being the, the, the one who gives us what we need to thrive and bear fruit. So we show an effective prayer life. We also show loving obedience. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that, your joy, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Obedience is the mark of a disciple, is a mark of the disciple that's connected to Jesus. But it's not a mindless robotic submission to what Jesus wants you to do. Again, it's not a checkbox. It's not a, I did it good and I didn't do it good, and my English is poor, Right? It's something where you respond in love. It says, abide in my love. That's what Jesus says, abide in my love. So it's believing, this is where obedience starts. It's believing that Jesus loves you unconditionally and that he's already paid for everything you need to earn. The areas of your life where you're disobedient is you don't believe that. You don't believe that the cross of Christ is sufficient for everything that you need. And so when I, when I go and do things that I know the Lord doesn't want me to do, I'm looking for sufficiency and nourishing from somewhere else. Pornography is a great example of this. I'm looking for an escape. I'm looking for something else to nourish me and feed me because I don't believe that Christ is enough. I don't believe he's enough. Jesus says, you, if you love me, You'll do what I command because this is how I show the Father that I love him. You can't give Jesus a big hug. Jesus is alive, but he has ascended into heaven. So how are you supposed to show Jesus that you love him the same way that he shows the Father? By being obedient, by responding to him in love. And apparently this does something for us. It gives us joy. Look back at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The culture around you tells you that you will be happiest when you are most free. There's some truth there because we do have freedom in Christ. However, apparently we will have ultimate joy when we are being obedient. We're following after what God has for us to do. And I think the reason for this is because you were created created to do that in the first place. 
to not do that is to violate what you were created to do. And it, it, it creates a sense of dissonance within us and it, and it makes us unhappy. So we show loving obedience. We also show self-sacrifice. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So the way that we show, that one of the, one of the ways that, that our connectedness to the vine shows is that we are self-sacrificing for other people. Jesus says that you love, or sorry, he says in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends, which is poignant coming from somebody who's literally about to do this. Jesus sacrificed for himself, or sacrificed himself for you. And so we approach the same thing. Now in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I lay down my life, no one takes it from me. Now that's what real sacrifice is. Choosing to do something when you have other choices. Oftentimes, though, we look at, like, I have to do something as self-sacrifice, right? Like, I don't have any choice. I will go and do it then. There's a lot of opportunities for us to be self-sacrificing. Many of you who are, are, are faithful attenders of church probably have once, one day a week where you actually get to sleep in. And if you have small children, that's even a myth. It doesn't exist. It's a legend that they say happens, and one day it will return to us. No, uh... Many times, Saturday morning might be the only time you have to sleep in. But instead, the opportunity is to get up and to go out and to serve on Saturday mornings here with the church. That's self-sacrifice. It's laying down your life for other people. Some of you live in a home uh, where one of the parents gets up early with the kids and the other one gets to sleep. I'm blessed for being the one that stays in bed most of the time. But one of the ways that you can show your spouse that you love them is to be the one that gets up early with the kids and let them sleep. Self-sacrifice. Some of us, many of us, have friends that are struggling. And we know that they're struggling, but we're kind of waiting on them to reach out rather than us reaching out to them. Self-sacrifice would say, I'm going to call them before things get to the point where they need to call me. We kind of have this rule where we, we want to cut toxic people out of our lives everybody's kind of toxic. If you want to be on an island by yourself and then not talk to yourself, you successfully cut toxic people out of your life. The whole point of the gospel is that Jesus came to rescue and redeem those who were toxic. And so we have the same mission. Now, obviously, barriers and boundaries are appropriate. But you're never going to cut toxic people out of your life fully. So we show self-sacrifice. We also show friendship with Jesus. Verse 14 You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father I have made known to you. Connected disciples understand and know what God says. So slaves just go and do what they're supposed to do, and they don't really ask why. But friends get to inquire. Friends get to know the motivations of the master. Not all of them necessarily, but we get to know his purposes. Did you know God calls uh, two people friends in scripture, Abraham and Moses? And did you know that you know more about God's plan of salvation and his eternal purposes than they did because of scripture? They looked forward hoping for a day when God would redeem and rescue creation, but they didn't know how he was going to do it. We know how he does it and we believe it. And you can be a friend of God because you know what he's doing and what he's about. So we stay in the word. We show that we're staying in the word. Get you a good study Bible. Make that a Christmas wish that you have. Circle that in a little magazine if people still do that. Good study Bible will help you understand what God is teaching and also consistently with what he's taught over the generations. You can study in a connect group and a family group. Let your home be a place where the word of God is proclaimed. I want you to think about something. When was the last time you read scripture out loud? Not silently, but out loud. Be someone that proclaims scripture in your home. I'm not saying you stand up on the kitchen table and read it out loud to your family. But during portions of your time with the Lord, read it out loud. And trust that the Lord will work through it. And then lastly, we show a passion for God's mission. Verse 16. Sorry. Sorry. Lost my place. There it is. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. So Jesus says a lot of stuff here. One, he says he's uh, chosen us. 
and he's appointed us. So it's not on us, but he's put us in a place. And that appoint is appointed to a role of ministry. And then we're supposed to go and bear fruit. And the fruit in mind here is very specific. It's incorporating more people into the vine. We can be a people because we are in the vine, because we're connected. We want to tell other people about how to be in the vine. We want to tell other people about how great the vine is, how great it is to be connected to Christ, to remain in him, to be loved so unconditionally. That's the greatest thing we've ever known. And so we become a people on mission. That's a fruit that is born out in our lives. So when I got to this part of my sermon preparation on Wednesday, I looked at what I had and I thought to myself, I still don't know what to do. I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, but something that I want to help you with today is, again, I want you to walk out of here and feel free. Remember we sang, I'm free, I'm free, forever I'm free. I want you to walk out of here and I want you to feel freedom to pursue Christ and know that like he's not keeping a scorecard because every effort you make towards following after Christ, if you are in Christ, that's something that's accepted by him. You don't have like to worry about that. So here's some things that I think you can put into practice. Successful disciples are everyday disciples. It's something we have to do every day. Successful disciples are everyday disciples. So we need to stick with it every single day. Okay, so you're not going to wake up tomorrow and be super disciple. Most likely. Holy Spirit can do amazing things, but more than likely, you're going to wake up tomorrow pretty much similar to the way you are today. That's okay. But we live in an instant gratification society, right? If my phone is slow, I have to get a new phone. Even though I can, you know, I think I've said before, you can get to the moon basically on the processing power of this phone in your pocket. It's not slow. We live in an instant gratification society, but God, in the, Jesus in this passage, uses an illustration of a vine. Plants grow slowly over time. Plants, plants don't sprout up overnight. You are a part of a plant, and as a branch, you're going to grow. And there's going to be seasons of growth where the Lord is working, he's doing something in your life, and you're just like this big old branch, just like, woo, look at me, it's so good, so nice. Your leaves are full in bloom, there's fruit, there's flowers, everything's great. It's like a Disney movie, it's great. And then there's going to be seasons of winter in your life where everything feels cold, you look dead, and God feels far away. And it's in those seasons where we need to trust that Christ is still working. Because the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus, lives inside of you. And he is working. And just like that tree in winter doesn't actually look alive, something is happening inside of that tree. Do you know what that tree is waiting for? Spring. And spring is coming. If you're in a season right now where you're dead, you're spiritually dead, you just don't feel alive, and I don't mean you've never believed in Jesus Christ. I mean, like, you trusted in Christ and you have followed him and you're just in a spell right now. And I can sympathize with this because I've been here, been here recently. You just feel dead. You don't feel connected to the Lord. Spring is coming. Stay with it every single day. Spring is coming. It's coming. It's coming. Stick with it every day. Also, ask yourself simple questions every single day. We like to complicate following Jesus because we like complicated things, and I'm not sure why that is, but we do. Um, we here at, at Park Cities, uh, and Brandon talked about this, our measures are these three simple questions, right? So I'm going to walk through them briefly, and you can apply these to your life and use them to kind of follow Jesus every day and really to kind of measure how it is that you're following. So what did God say? Ask yourself, what did God say? And if you want, be specific. What is God saying when I read this passage of Scripture? What is God saying about himself? Because scripture is God revealing himself to us. He wants us to, to know about him. So what is God saying about himself? What is he saying about me? About humanity? About the world that I live in? What is he saying about himself? And then the next question, how will I obey? Now for me, I am a recovering Baptist. Um, I like uh, check boxes. I struggle with legalism in my life. So when I hear how will I obey, I immediately run to like, oh man, I'm in trouble if I don't do this. So for me personally, and I, I guess I give you permission uh, to do this, change the wording maybe. How will I respond is what I use. How will I respond? It opens up a little bit more freedom for me personally. Because if I'm in a psalm and the psalmist is extolling the greatness of God, there might not be something to obey, but I might respond in worship. 
and in glorifying God. That's still obedience. It just uh, feels a little more free to me. And then who will I tell? Who will I tell? This is hard for us. I don't think you need to go and like present the gospel every time that you are in scripture. It's good if you do. But every time you are in God's word as a true branch of the vine, there's an opportunity for you to go and tell someone else about what God is speaking into your life. And not in a way of being like, oh man, this sermon, this one's talking about being forgiving. Becky really needs to hear that. Because Becky's a jerk. Sorry if your name's Becky. I don't really think you're a jerk. No, you hear something and it resonates with you. You feel the Holy Spirit working in your life and you're like, oh man, like I, this is true for me and oh man, this is so true for this person too. I know that they're dealing with the same thing. But so often what God wants to do in our life becomes stillborn because we don't vocalize it. Right? I mean, think about this. How did God create? He speaks. He speaks. And we are made in the image of God. I'm not saying you can create out of nothing by speaking. This isn't Harry Potter, okay? But what I am saying is for many of us, and I'm a verbal processor, obviously, somebody that has to talk through things, something becomes real for me when I say it. And if you're that kind of person, don't let things stay in. Speak them out to other people around you. And then lastly, we need to trust Christ every day. Ultimately, it is the Lord who, is works, who will work in your life. I would really love to stand up here before you and tell you, you can do these three things and you'll be close to Jesus. It's not how it works. The, the, the seminal truth of our faith is that even our faith is a gift from God. Everything that we have is a gift from God. So stop trying to earn it. Doing good things is great. Loving other people is great. But if you're doing it to try and earn God's approval, you're just adding to disapproval. I know that sounds convoluted, but Jesus tells us that I love you. That's what he says. He says, I love you. And I prove this by going to the cross and dying on the cross for your sins and mine. And the way you become a believer, the way you become a branch is you believe that truth for the first time. You say, man, I, I believe that. I know I can't earn that. And maybe you've never done that today. Like that, that's, this could be the greatest day of your life because you could believe that truth for the first time that Jesus loves you and died for you unconditionally. Unconditionally. And all he wants you to do is believe that he's taking care of it. And you don't need to do anything else. For the rest of us who have been maybe believers for a while or a short time, our tendency is to go back to try and earn it. Gotta earn it, gotta earn it, gotta earn it. Jesus isn't happy with me. The Father looks at the vine and he is pleased with the branches. He doesn't look at the branches and think, oh, what has the vine got to do? We are in Christ. We are with him. And because we are in him, we are righteous. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you made him your Lord and Savior, there is no more earning it. There's only responses in love. And so when you fail, when you fall, it's not because you're a bad Christian because you've stopped remaining in the vine. And the way that you remain in the vine is you believe that he loves you and that he gave himself up for you. That's it. It's that simple. And it's that hard. Because the world around you wants to tell you all sorts of things. Because the world around us wants to win. And wants to make you the star and me the star and them the star. There is only one star. And it is Jesus Christ. And they crucified him. And so I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you are looking for a church. I don't know if you're looking for the Lord. I don't know what you're looking for. But I know you can find it in the vine. And you can connect to him today. If you want to know how to do that, you know to come to our next steps room. Come and join us over there. Talk to us. Maybe something I said wasn't clear. That happens sometimes. I would love to try and explain it personally to you and apply it to your life. Help you with it. We need to remain connected. And that's the measure of a true Christian. Over every single day of your life, do I trust him? And if the answer is yes, success. If the answer is no, 
then we pray through that too. We turn to him and we say, Lord, work. Help my unbelief because I want to believe. Let's go to him now. Lord Jesus, we want to go where you go and we want to do the things with you that you do. We want to follow you. And oftentimes that is hard for us because we, we want to create a scorecard. We want to know that we're, we're going in the right direction. And so we come before you today, Lord, and we listen to your words, words of love and acceptance. And we know that through the gospel, we can have peace with you, peace with the Father. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here that hasn't ever really trusted you, God, trusted your words, I pray that they would today. I pray that your spirit would collapse whatever walls they have. I pray that for those of us that just have a hard time believing it on a day-to-day -day basis, that a God so great and loving could have anything to do with me. I pray that you would heal us of our unbelief in areas of our life where it shows. I pray that we would bear much fruit for the glory of the vine. And it's in your son's name I pray. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.